Fragen stellen. Sorry, you could ask questions. And questions from the interwebs, better drop them on Twitter under the hashtag Borg and 36C3. And on our IRC channel, 36C3. Xbox, yeah, one, two, three. Okay, uh, who a PlayStation? I call that even. <laughs> Computers don't count, they run open source software, so forget about that. Uh, our next speaker, Boris Lavin, will tell you a little bit more about hacking Sony PlayStation Blu-ray drives. Please welcome, with a very warm applause, Boris. Hello everyone, so let's start. My name is Boris Larin, I'm security research at Kaspersky, and at work I'm doing reverse engineering. Currently my main focus is to find the zero days exploited in the world, and I helped to report a few of them. All of them were used in attacks by cover criminals and national state actors. I'm also an original discoverer of a few large supply chain attacks. Maybe you heard about our research operation Shadow Hammer. It was released early this year. But some people might also know me as Saktaxor. I was active in the PlayStation 3 homebrew development community since 2011. And back then, I was mostly known for my work on freeing DRM protected PlayStation 3 custom firmware, developing PlayStation 3 debugging tools, and etc. And today, I'm going to talk about my two favorite subjects, which are video game consoles and hacking. So, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about Blu ray disk drives of Sony PlayStation 3 and Sony PlayStation 4. So games, they are distributed at optical media. So that's why drives should contain the best security possible. But it also makes it a very interesting subject for security research. And in this presentation, I'm going to discuss a process of obtaining and reverse engineering the firmware. I will provide a depth analysis of vulnerabilities and the exploitation to achieve code execution on the multiple models of Sony PlayStation Duradi drives. And I will talk about security features that are present there. But uh, before I continue with my talk, I need to give the following disclaimer. First of all, this research doesn't have nothing to do with my employer. And uh, this research is done purely of curiosity and presented for educational purposes. Uh, this research doesn't anyhow help, support, enable, or endorse to break the corporate law. I will be talking about security vulnerabilities, but as far as I'm aware, they do not lead to full compromise of security, and it's not possible to use them to its convenient copy protection. And that's the reason why I'm even talking about that. So probably all of you are quite familiar with what Blu-ray disc is. Uh, Sony, they did extremely well with PlayStation 2. It was the very first game console to, that supported DVD discs, and people were buying it to watch DVD movies. And Sony, they wanted to repeat their success with the next game console, PlayStation 3. And it's really easy to understand that just by looking at the timeline of events. Like, Specifications were finalized, and the first commercial Blu-ray drives, they were released just a month prior to release of PlayStation 3. And actually, Sony succeeded. Now even Xbox uses uh, Blu-ray discs. And actually, physical format of Blu-ray discs is very well documented in white papers and patents. Those documents, they reveal um, what types of discs exist, and how this, uh, what areas are present on discs, and how these areas are different from each other, and what structures are stored there. So if you're really interested in the subject, I recommend you to read these documents. But these documents, they do not reveal one simple thing, how PlayStation disks are verified. And uh, it's kind of an interesting question, and I was always wondering about that. So my initial thought was that maybe drive firmware may reveal some details about that. So let's talk about Blu-ray Blu drives PlayStation. And there have been a lot of them. If you will unpack PlayStation 3 firmware update, you will find uh, 12 different uh, firmware for different drive models, which is a really huge number. And uh, here you can see the first ever P uh, PCB of the first ever Blu-ray drive for PlayStation 3. Uh, design is quite complicated, but the main microcontroller, microcontroller is produced by Sony. And, uh, well, after some time, Sony decided to simplify design of PCB, and they switched to microcontroller of another company, Rinsas. 
And here you can see PCB of the first uh, Blu ray drive with uh, Rini SAS microcontroller. And after that, Sony decided to switch between Sony microcontroller and Rini SAS microcontroller for each new drive model. Well, I actually don't know what they were thinking, but maybe they wanted to diversify this platform to make hacking much more harder. And uh, Sony was, was much more consistent with the Blu ray drives for PlayStation 4. If you will unpack PlayStation 4 firmware update, you will find firmwares for six different drive models. And all of them were based on Rin SAS microcontroller. And only recently, they, uh, there was also a new addition to this family. It was a MediaTek microcontroller. So as you see, uh, Rin SAS is the most common chip for Blu-ray drives across PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4. And that's why it's the main subject of this talk. So first of all, uh, how did they get the firmware in the first place? Actually, this technique came out from Xbox 360 scene. And uh, here you can see a very famous picture of Kamikaze hack for Xbox 360 drive that was developed by a quite talented researcher, Jeremia. And uh, this hack, it abused the fact that quite often, uh, firmware is stored on a flash chip that is a separate die inside the package. And uh, this way, it's much more uh, easier for the manufacturer to produce such chips. But at the same time, it also makes it somehow easy to read flash contents with external tools if you are able to decapsulate package. And uh, here you can see decapsulated package of Rinsas microcontroller for PlayStation 3 drive. You can see that flash chip is also separate die and it's located on, on the top of mine chip. So how are you able to dump firmware using this technique? So at first, you need to decapsulate your package. That can be done with acid. Then you cut bound wires, for example, with laser. And then you need to rebound this uh, virus to custom PCB, for example, with special uh, wire binding machine or with uh, silver paint. And then you are able to read flash contents. And actually, all the steps, they were done not by me. Uh, they were done by more experienced researcher who had much more experience with this kind of stuff. And he also did uh, quite similar things with Xbox 360 drive. But it was a quite uh, friendly researcher because he shared his dump with me and with a few other researchers from our community, just free of charge. And the only thing that I was needed to start reverse engineering was to find out what architecture it's compiled for. And uh, I checked the website of Rinsas. They got a really huge list of different vinegar controllers. And uh, luckily, there was also some documents on this website that revealed that uh, microcontrollers uh, of, for Blu-ray drives and DVD drives produced by Rinsas are actually based on H8S architecture. And uh, quite luckily, this architecture is supported by the Pro. So it was very easy to start reverse engineering. And here is a few more words about this architecture. It's a nice risk architecture, but it reminds me x86 a little. It's uh, really easy to work with. Uh, you can get three different compilers for it. And um, one fun thing is that each of them uses different kind of convention. And there is even differences in kind of convention between different versions of Hue, which is the official compiler for this architecture. It's sold by Rinsas. And so I began reverse engineering. And I need to mention that it was a quite challenging task. Because firmware, it's a really uh, large in size, almost 2 megabytes. And there are only 40 strings for the whole amount of data. And uh, in case you are wondering how the developers were able to debug the firmware in this case, well, log trace functionality exists, but it only takes an ID as an argument. And then th these IDs are converted to strings inside sp special software the developer has. Most likely it was done this way due to size constraints. There are basically no sp uh, extra space on flash to store the strings. But maybe they were thinking about security, but it, it complicates serious engineering. And uh, the first thing that you want to do in such cases when you start to reverse engineer some new firmware is that you want to download as much stuff as you can from the website of hardware manufacturer. You want to get source codes, you want to get libraries, you want to get compilers, and you need all of that to make the process of reverse engineering much more easier. Like, you might want to get, uh, generate fitted signatures for IDA Pro, and you also need uh, definitions and structures of different hardware uh, registers. And during SAS, they provide a really huge stuff, uh, a really huge list of stuff in the load. But, unfortunately, any DVD, Blu-ray Blu related stuff is not available publicly, 
and it's really complicated the whole project. I had to reverse engineer all of it. And um, RINSAS also, also provides dozens of different real time version systems. So some are available for download, you can get them. And also official compiler is uh, available for download. So you get, get a compiler that was likely used to compile firmware we are going to analyze. And when I was looking through the files of Q compiler, I was not able to find any sources of libraries. Because it appeared that all of them are stored inside special packages and only necessary files unpacked during compilation. But what I did was just I found out where this algorithm is located and I wrote my own utility to unpack all these files. And I was not able to find any useful information about hardware there, but um, it was possible to generate IDAPRO flick signatures. And many of these functions that were used by firmware of that, that I've got, and it was a really useful finding. And the next step that I would usually do when I'm analyzing a new firmware is that I try to find out functions of real time version system. It's a really important thing to do because um, control flow and data, it might be passed between different tasks that are running at the same time. And you really need to follow that during reverse engineering. So I got many real time version systems from the website of Renaissance. And all of them were kind of similar, but still had some differences. And in most of the cases, uh, they were written in assembly for different architectures. So in the end, nothing really closely matched uh, real time version systems that was used in PlayStation firmware. So in the end, it was not useful. But the best thing about reverse engineering firmware developed by a Japanese company is that it most likely will follow micro industrial tron specification. And this specification is a real lifesaver because it defines the name of the functions, the arguments, and et cetera. There are more than 300 pages. And uh, it simplifies reverse engineering a lot. And the next step that I would usually do is that I try to understand how I can communicate with my target and what logic I am able to interact with. And Blu-ray disk drive, it communicates through ATA protocol. And here provide hierarchy of ATA protocols. So at the bottom, we have physical interfaces. We have PETA that was previously known as just ETA or ED. It's an obsolete version of this protocol. And then we also have a SETA. And on top of that, we have two distinct command sets. We have ATA command set. It's used for hard disk drives. And we have an ATAPI command set. It's used in all, other, in all other cases. And basically, it's just a transfer for CSI commands. And uh, de uh, different devices, they may have uh, different command sets because we have a primary command set, which is common for all devices. And then we have device-specific command sets. And uh, for optical disk drives, we even have two competing specifications. And you need to be aware of that when you reverse engineering such firmware. So primary command set, it implements in query command, and it provides some basic information about, um, about hardware, like name of the vendor, name, name of the product. It's basically what you're going to see if you connect such device to a computer. So what you do, you just look for such string, strings inside firmware, and you will find a handler of CSA commands. And then you're good to go from there. You just get specification and uh, reverse engineer some commands that looks interesting for you. So basically, this is a roadmap that I'm usually try to follow when reverse engineering some new firmware. And it would be also awesome if we had a way to emulate our firmware, because this way we can analyze uh, it much more better. And also getting code execution would be nice, because we can actually do some ex experiments. And it also helps to analyze hardware and firmware. And GDB, it, it actually provides a simulator for this architecture. So you can compile it, convert firmware to the air file, and then you're good to go. You can debug some snippets of code. But I actually like using IDA Pro as debugger GUI, but it has some flaws, of course. Um, so first of all, uh, GDB debugger plugin that comes with IDA, it's closed source. And recently, Hexrace improved it a lot, but back then it was quite buggy, and it supported only a few targets. And of course, this architecture was not in the list. So at some point, I decided to write my own GDB debugger plugin to work with IDA Pro. And uh, actually, it was a quite good decision because it didn't take too much time to make, but it saved a lot of time while debugging this firmware and some other firmwares. For example, GDB support for X64 targets was added only in IDA Pro 6.9, and it was not that long ago. 
And here's just a screenshot, screenshot of how it looks like. I leave it just for the reference. So, actually, while I was a reverse, en reverse engineering firmware of PlayStation, I was reverse engineering multiple firmwares because it appeared that there exist some Blu ray drives for PC that had a, a microcontroller produced by Renesas. And they were produced by Hitachi LG Data Storage. And you can get not encrypted firmware from firmware update utility. And I compared these two firmwares. Uh, it's clear that the PC firmware and PlayStation firmware are very different, but they are built using the same SDK. I can tell that because many Blu-ray hardware-related functions are the same. Uh, all peripheral devices are located at the same addresses and uh, assessed exactly the same. PC firmware uses the same cryptographic processor. And PC firmware also contains a little bit more debug strings. It kind of re reveals the name of uh, this RINSAS platform for Blu-ray disk drives. It's called Indigo 3 internally. So at previous slide, I mentioned the cryptographic processor. So when I began reverse engineering firmware of PlayStation, I found out that a really huge part of it is occupied by crypt-related functions. And uh, these crypt-related functions, they are used for communication with a uh, dedicated cryptographic processor. And it effectively protects all the secrets. So you, can, uh, you are not able to just dump firmware and reverse engineer all of it. Uh, cryptographic processor protects it. And the communication process is really complicated and obscure. Here provides some graphs of such crypt-related functions. And actually, uh, for me, it's much more easier to reverse LLVM obfuscated binary chain uh, understand logic of such functions. And here I provide a small snippet of one of such functions. And uh, it's clear that cryptographic processor runs some kind of firmware, and you are able to load additional modules and additional keys. And uh, what I wanted to do, I just wanted to play with this cryptographic processor. I just wanted to try to change some of these values to see what happens. But you need code execution for that. And now it comes the time to talk about code execution and how it was achieved. So early this year, I gave a presentation at Consequest titled Hacking Microcontroller Firmwares Through USB. You can find more details by the following link. But in that research, I examined how awesome is the USB protocol for exploitation. And I believe that a CSI protocol might be even more awesome, but it's less common for sure. So how does it work? A client sends a common descriptor block to device. I will call it just a command. And such commands, usually device supports a lot of them, and they can be used to transfer data from an into device. And um, uh, device also provides status of command and also provides error code. And quite often, um, such commands, they have such parameters as size, size of the data in some uh, logical block address. So all of that makes this protocol uh, perfect for target for fuzzing, I believe. But uh, I actually found my vulnerabilities through static analysis. So it seems that firmware itself was developed by some third party company. And uh, then when it was ready, it was handed to Sony to add console specific stuff. And uh, I can tell that because all general com CSI commands, they are looking kind of fine, but no commands implemented by Sony. They doesn't seem to have boundary checks. Like uh, one of the examples of vulnerable commands has operation called E1, and this is command is used for notification of Blu-ray drive and video game console. So the main target of it is to implement security. But it has out of bound right in, uh, because transfer length is not checked. So we are able to write this buffer that is like it's somewhere over here, but what memory does it belong? So to find out this answer, let's take a look at memory map that I was able to come up with while reverse engineering uh, firmware of PlayStation. So at first we have no volatile memory. We have a ROM with bootloader, we have flash with mine firmware. Then we have volatile memory, we have SRAM and DRAM, and it's clear that address that we are able to rewrite is belongs to DRAM. And we also have um, registers of peripheral devices. So let's start with SRAM. It's a static random access memory. It's small in size, it's executable, but it's configurable, and it contains interrupt vector table, it contains code of real-time pressure system, it contains some important variables, pointer structures, and it also contains 
stacks of tasks. And we also have the DRM, which is dynamic random access memory. It's large in size, 8 megabytes to be precise. And initially, exact memory location was unknown because most of the time it's accessed through direct memory access. And it contains data from disk, it contains data from a CSI client, and it also contains data that do not fit SRAM. Because SRAM is really small and firmware is really huge. It needs a lot of space to store its variables, so why to not store them in DRAM? And actually, one of such um, regions is used only for that, to store variables that do not fit to SRAM. And I also found out about the existence of another region. It's actually uh, unused in PlayStation firmware, but I found out that it exists from firmware of uh, Hitachi LG data storage drive. So we are able to write uh, some data that is located inside this buffer. How to exploit that? And uh, well, exploitation turned out to be very difficult because all variables, they are located at static addresses, and the heap exploitation techniques, they are not working there. And at first, you need to find a very good exploitation primitive, and you might need to write a lot of uh, different uh, data upon reaching this primitive, and you need to do that without crashing the device. And I need to mention that debugging is complicated. We are not able to debug it on real hardware. So we need to emulate, understand a really large portions of firmware. So in the end, I ended up reverse engineering all functions that access data in this region. And there are no virtual function pointers, so there are no good candidates for the write. And there are a lot of buffers, structures, variables. Pointers exist, but there are not too much of them. But eventually, I was able to find the good exploitation primitive. And I started to develop exploit. But actually, I, was never, uh, I never finished this exploit, because while writing it, I was able to find a new source for vulnerabilities. So DSP registers are very interesting. They are responsible for the most of this drive-related functionality, like a tap interface, laser, servo, disk data demodulation, DSP firmware loading, and etc. It will be so nice if we had access to it. And actually, we do. Like the whole area of DSP uh, region is available for read and write through special CSI commands, and those CSI commands exist for doing just that. And here they are. It's uh, actually a read buffer and write buffer commands with special parameters. And it seems that these functions are part of standard diagnostic functionality because exactly the same functions are also available in uh, uh, Hitachi LG data storage firmware. So do you remember when I said that DRAM is accessed mostly through DMA? Several registers available in this area are responsible for copy data from in the, in, into DRAM and mapping DRAM offsets to some memory addresses. So it appeared that these regions that are st used to store firmware data, they are actually mapped using these registers available in this region. And we have access to them with uh, CSI commands. So here I explain uh, how does it work. We have uh, four groups of memory mapping registers. And the two groups are set like showed on this picture, on this slide. And uh, I do not show others two because they are set frequently by different functions. They are set to different function, uh, by to different values. But uh, these two are initialized early uh, during startup, and they are set to these specific values and not touched after that. And each group of uh, these registers they map specific amount of data from the RAM offset to some predefined memory address. And here you also can see to which uh, memory addresses which offsets are mapped. And the RAM offset is calculated like this. Uh, value of region uh, re uh, register is multiplied by 4,000 in hex. And then this value is added to either first half or second half of the RAM, depending on the bit that is set. But that's not all. We have uh, specially dedicated registers that allow us to read and write double word to any of set of DRAM. And uh, here I provide a pseudocode for doing just that. So we have access to DMI registers with CSI commands. Are we able to manipulate contents of DRAM? There are multiple ways of achieving this. 
for, for example, we are able to remap uh, this special region to some another DRAMAP set, and we can uh, write, uh, we can use out our exploit to write some data that will be not reachable otherwise. But it may lead to a different behavior, and uh, I'll need to mention again that debugging is really complicated. And we also are able to use DMI registers to write our data directly. But actually, it's not true because these registers, they are in use by firmware. And uh, if we will try to do something, it will lead to different behavior as well. But still, I was believing that I may exploit that. A and I only needed a way to test my ideas on real hardware. And there are two ways of doing that. Uh, f first of all, you are able to jailbreak your console. You can install Linux on it, thanks to fail overflow, and you can communicate with Blu-ray drive. Another option, you can disconnect your Blu-ray drive from console and connect it to PC. And I decided to go with the second road because it's much more convenient, and likely it was possible to buy a ready-made solution for doing just that. Uh, I actually wanted to test my ideas on a PlayStation 4 drive because PlayStation 3 drive and PlayStation 4 drive, they are very the same. They just using different FFC connectors. But um, difference is not that um, uh, big because I was able to modify FFC cable of PlayStation 4 with scissors and it worked uh, with public solution for PS3 drive. So this is basically how my the whole uh, hacking setup looked like and it's a drive of PlayStation 4, by the way. So the first thing that I did was to dump the whole DSP region, and it was quite a surprise, but um, uh, address of DMI request and value of DMI requests, they were set to zeros, and it will indicate only one of two things. It's either in, uh, inside my uh, model, hardware revision that I've got, DMI registers are not present at all, or they're just unused. And they were just unused. So in new, newer models, Sony accidentally stopped to use D, uh, DMA to access DRAM. They started to use uh, absolute memory addresses. And it grants us um, a full read-write access to the whole DRAM. Yeah. So doing cool stuff with full access to DRAM. Usually DRAM is uh, full of this data. But when there is no disk inside, there are a lot of unused space. And this space is used to store firmware during system update. And the procedure of Blu-ray uh, drive firmware update for PS3 is well documented. You can find it on our wiki. And this procedure is exactly the same between PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4. But here I try to explain how it, um, how it looks like from the side of Blu-ray drive. So at first, block is of firmware is received with the right buffer command. And uh, firmware checks. Is it a first block? If it's the case, that will, then it will initiate a special structure and uh, will store this block to DRAM. And then it checks if all, all blocks are received. If all blocks are received, then it will try to validate the hash. And if hash is correct, it will start to decrypt the firmware. But this process of decrypting firmware, it may, have, may take some time. And uh, how this logic was intended to work is video game console should send a test unit ready command to check if firmware was already decrypted. And there is a special logic inside that checks if it was decrypted, then it will uh, copy a firmware update code, code to SRAM and execute it. So do you see a problem here? Well, basically, it's time of check to time of user vulnerability. Because um, uh, when it starts to decrypt firmware, uh, we, we, what we are able to do, we are able just to send our firmware to Blu-ray drive, wait until it's been decrypted, and when it will be decrypted, we are able to use our DMA trick to just dump the whole DRAM. And we also are able to modify a firmware image after validation, and we are also able to change uh, some structures that are stored there. So at the first, I had only um, uh, firmware for this particular drive hardware revision. But I've got this one, and then I've got this one, and this one, and it's PlayStation 4, by the way, and I've got even more. So on this stage, manipulation of firmware image uh, to get execution is trivial, and all update structures are stored in DRAM, 
it's basically a hint for those who want to repeat my steps at home. And when you exploit such devices, usually you need to be extremely careful because uh, this device it has internal memory. If you corrupt something there, you will turn your device into brick. So you will have to spend uh, a lot of money to buy just a new device and uh, do your experiments uh, all over again. But actually, in this case, I need to mention that a special mini firmware exists. It's called emergency boot. And, uh, well, during boot, bootloader checks if um, your mine firmware has a valid uh, hash. And if it's not the case, then this special firmware will be executed. So you will be still be able to unbreak your device. So why did it happen? Most likely scenario is that, uh, is that when firmware was handed to Sony to add console specific stuff, engineers didn't really understood functionality that is available through DSP registers. And CSA commands to read and write DSP registers they were left for diagnostic purposes for sure. But security risks uh, represented by free use of DSP registers, they were not really considered. So uh, with code execution, uh, I was able to do some experiments. Like community always wondered, what is this uh, ma mastery block data that Sony puts to disk when it's processed at factory? Because algorithm to decrypt it was nowhere to be found. And I was able to decrypt it, and actually there are nothing interesting inside. Uh, here you can see Final Fantasy 15 for PS4, and at first there are just uh, 16 random bytes. It's just a padding. They are not used anyhow. And then just a few flags to set uh, some drive identification states. And uh, for me, it also was interesting to see how disks, disk keys are obtained. Because this information should be somehow related to the way how disks are verified. And for PS3, there are two disk keys. One is used for decryption of disk data, and another one is used for encryption of saves data. And all of this is about the same for PS4. And I found out that uh, these keys are, returned, are returned from cryptographic processor, but it ho happens only in case of drive identification. So initially, I was thinking that this logic to read and construct these keys, it should be located there, inside cryptographic processor. So here are a few more words about drive identification. So the drive identification and the drive cryptographic processor, it's the main things behind optical disk drive security of Sony PlayStation. And drive identification is secure and performed with spare console keys, and I know only two ways to obtain those keys. You either need to hack your cryptographic processor or video game console. It's called a spool for PS3 or some of PS4. Or you need to hack cryptographic processor or Blu-ray drive. And it's very hard to achieve such hacks, so security model is uh, very effective against widespread piracy. Much more simple ways to pirate games always existed. For example, if you hack mine firmware of PlayStation, you can pirate games. But if you hack firmware of PlayStation Blu-ray drive, you can't pirate games. And uh, I was thinking how to better illustrate the security model. And uh, it's the best was what I was able to come up with. So imagine we have two floating islands. And it's actually firmwares. And those firmwares, they support white castles. And these white castles are cryptographic processors. And please take a notice that there are no entrances to those castles. So you are not allowed to get in from in firmware. But there is also secure communication happens between these castles. Mm, well, it was the best that I was able to come up with. <laughs> and uh, like, if you hack firmware of video game console, you are able to bypass the secure communication. You just take this data that comes out of it, and you just run it on uh, your console. You, so you pirate games. But if you have firmware of Blu-ray drive, you are not able to put your data in the secure communication. You are not able to send uh, this key. Uh, so you are not, not able to pirate. And uh, I also was able to play with cryptographic processor. It was, uh, it was initially, it was the reason why I needed code execution. And uh, I did some experiments. I was able to load crypto firmware of PlayStation 3 drive to PlayStation 4 drive. And uh, PlayStation 4 drive, the cryptographic processor started to behave exactly like it should on PlayStation 3. Even some of sets of some cryptographic uh, registers, they have changed. So it proves my idea that uh, it runs some kind of firmware. 
And uh, like as you know, I mentioned that communication process is quite complicated and I wanted to try to change some values. So I wrote a specially deviated fuzzer to f uh, flip some bits of these values that are set to registers. And it was a uh, completely useless because if you change a new such values, cryptographic processor returns error. And after a few errors, cryptographic processor hangs and you need to reset the device. So allegedly, uh, I think that uh, logic of such cryptographic functions, it works like this. At first, you provide some seed of the hash, then you provide commands, then you provide data and keys, you provide hash to verify these commands, and in the end, these commands, they are verified and executed. And I played a little bit more with cryptographic processor, but eventually I lost interest because breaking copy protection was never a goal, and uh, more reverse engineering, it revealed that most likely crypto processor exists only for doing crypto stuff. And there exists a specially dedicated component that verifies disks, but most likely it's performed purely in hardware. I was able to find out about that with the help of the first ever PlayStation 3 uh, retail drive. So it has a few components, but the uh, mine components are these two. It's a mine microcontroller produced by Sony. It has uh, ARM CPU. And we also have a one megabyte uh, NOR flash with firmware by Spencer. So one megabyte NOR flash with firmware. So actually firmware is executed from external flash. And that is decrypted on fly. And of course, a grid, a grid algorithm is based on XOR. So we have uh, some XOR team of specific size, but FIMVAR is much more larger. And what we do, we do what we always do in such cases. We just look for the, some space in FIMVAR filled by zeros, and we are able to partially recover XOR team. And now it can be used to encrypt or decrypt some pieces of FIMVAR. Not, not all of that, but some pieces. So I mentioned that code executed from external flash, but integrity of firmware is checked at boot. So it seems like we are not able to do something with that, right? Well, actually, no, because we are able to observe all memory accesses and uh, reads from CPU to external flash with logic analyzer. We are able to modify those accesses with FPGA. And we can write smart logs that encrypts. Um, we can encrypt it with recovery, uh, with recovery source stream, and uh, we can modify some memory accesses from CPU after firmware is verified to execute this small payload. So with our payload, we can read plain text and leak it. So we get code execution and firmware dump. And uh, this firmware was quite interesting. Because unlike Rinsas firmware, it contains a lot of debug strings. It even has a special serial monitor with huge list of commands. And uh, some of these commands are looking interesting. You see peak, dump, poke, and there are much more. And, uh, but you need uh, some special password to access it. I need to mention that. Uh, also, crypto processor is uh, this drive was has it, but it's very simple, very different from the one that was used in the RISAS. It's also much more simple. You just set keys, data, size of data to sp some specific offsets in crypto region, and then you initiate operation. And uh, like, if you try to read this crypto region from the flash, uh, you will be not able to do that. Uh, you will get only garbage to CPU registers. So it was intended to work like you need to use special functions that are present in the bootloader to offset only specific offsets inside this cryptography, this crypto region. But of course, you can bypass it with the return oriented programming. And also, all these functions, they have integral overflows. So this check, I think it's useless. You are able to read the whole crypto region anyway. And if you do that, there'll be uh, one interesting string in, uh, at the start address of this crypto region, and it should be not possible to read it otherwise. And uh, Sony microcontroller and the RINSAS microcontroller, they are completely different systems. And it means that uh, all peripheral devices 
uh, should be different and they should be accessed differently. But I found out one peripheral device that accessed exactly the same. So it means that one particular peripheral device is exactly the same in both uh, in different hardware, such as Sony and Ring Sass microcontrollers. The only different difference in addresses. In Sony microcontroller, those registers are located inside special region, and in Ring Sass, they are accessed through Indigo DSP registers. So I believe uh, this peripheral device is actually a disk security component. And it performs some interesting things, like it uh, firmware calculates CRC of disk title, source it with a string Nokia, and puts it into registers of this device. And if you modify it, then cryptographic processor will not be able to return this key. So, so I know one part of disk verify process, but to find out the rest will be a re really challenging task if it implemented purely in hardware. And one more fun fact, Noki is short for Inoki, which is a very tasty mushroom in Japanese cuisine. So let's make a conclusions. I think that Sony and partners, they did exceptional work. Security model is really good and has proven itself. Imagine, uh, PlayStation Android drives, they existed since 2006, but no public hack since then. But many have tried, according to rumors. So here is one lesson that we also can learn from this example. Uh, firmware can be hacked, so put all your secrets to hardware. In this case, uh, guys like me, they will have some problems reverse engineering it. And also believe that uh, cryptographic process might be an interesting real-world target if you're into glitching and uh, side-channel analysis. But it will be a tough one, I believe. And I want to give my respects to everyone who also ever worked on this subject of hacking PlayStation Blu-ray drives. And uh, I want to say thank you, know who you are. This research will be not possible without you. And uh, here's a few more words about uh, responsible disclosure. So on November 2008, a security team at uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment reached out to me and said, uh, we saw your presentation. You're going to talk about it at CCC. Uh, can you give us some information about that? Well, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I provided reg information regarding my vulnerabilities. And uh, it was quite a surprise what happened next. Like, it was totally not expected. But the uh, security team invited me to join, to join a recently launched bug bounty. And uh, they triaged all my vulnerabilities. They told me that it's a uh, high and two medium severity bugs. Uh, they told me that it's not critical in no way. And all vulnerabilities were fixed in uh, the latest system software version that came out just um, ten, nine days ago. So it seems that I have become a first researcher who uh, won a bounty of hopeless station bug. So please stay tuned. Uh, Sony is about to announce something really awesome. I'm sure that all of you are going to like that. And uh, actually, uh, I had a very pleasant experience with working with them, and uh, I rec can recommend you do that in the future. So all my slides, they will be uploaded by the following link. And I want to say thank you. Thank you very much, Boris Lein. If you have questions, you know how it works. Ah, the interwebs has questions already. Um, there are microphones. Microphones one, two, uh, seven, and uh, two to eight. Please make a perfect row, and we will queue you. So the interwebs, quest, first question. The interwebs is asking, if the, is the USB to SATA adapter just a common chipset with a FFC connector? Uh, yep, that's the case. <laughs> So ju just some common parts that you are able to get and uh, you can solder it yourself. But for me it was convenient to just buy one because it was freely available. Short answer. Uh, microphone number one, please. 
so I think there are some third party like drive emulation hardware available in the market. Do you know something about it? Have you hacked some, something or is it like not secured from that way that you can replace the hardware with your own basically emulation device? So like, like I mentioned, for doing that, you need uh, a way to bypass this secure communication, right? And uh, for doing that, like this secure communication is secure. You need to get, to get per console keys. And to get those keys, uh, it's a really challenging task. Like maybe you remember the presentation of fail overflow, like when uh, many years ago when they were able to break a spool, right? Uh, we have not seen something like that for SAMU, which is a cryptographic processor of PS4. But uh, st still, like even for PS3, the Sony they were able to fix these bugs, and uh, like in newer model, uh, in new hardware revisions, there were no such bugs, and uh, that's why it, uh, it's a challenging task to make some uh, hardware emulation devices. That's all because uh, per console keys are used. Thank you very much. And microphone number seven, I think. Um, is the Sony MCU some sort of a derivative of uh, Toshiba MCUs, uh, the Toshiba ARM MCUs, like in the PS Vita, or is it something else? Uh, actually, I don't know. Uh, I have spent the most of this, uh, of, of the most of time of my research on looking at Renaissance stuff. And uh, I actually never had a chance to take a look at uh, Toshiba PSP stuff. So I actually not able to tell you for sure. Okay, thanks. Microphone number two, please. Have you looked at how the drive verifies whenever a disk is a real PS3 or PS4 disk from the manufacturer, or is it just a home burned disk? No, uh, so yeah, it's actually um, was present in my presentation. So. I believe that a specially dedicated component exists, and disks, they are verified uh, by this component, and this logic is implemented by hardware. And uh, I know that some parts exist, like to, to set some data from software, like this one where it calculates CRC of disk title and source it with some magic value. I'm sure that this is part of disk verify process, but the rest of the magic, it's unknown because it is hardware. You need to reverse engineer this. Uh, yeah, and this okay. kind of hard. Okay, thanks. Uh, the internet. The internet has a more complex question for you. Why is there more interest in hacking PS3 or 4 than Xbox? Maybe because there's no need to privacy because every Xbox game is a Windows game. Ah uh, no. Well. You know, like um, people love, people like PlayStations because they got exclusives, right? And um, uh, well, also, well, Xbox security is kind of very good. I, I mean, I, I actually believe it's better than the PlayStation security. Um, some of my friends had experience with it, and uh, it's really painful to work with that because well, Microsoft they uh, protect your computers. They, so they protect your computers and they have technologies that they can use to protect uh, their intellectual property. And they also add some special stuff like some new techniques, some novel ideas. And uh, you, they use all of that to make uh, hacking even much more harder than to hack a computer. Thank you for that. And as far as I can see, and no one is shaking and waving hands, we have no more questions left. Please, with a very warm applause, Boris Lein. Thank you. Oh. I think we're out.